check hello Hey, hey. Hello, can we do a sound check for translation? Check. Hey, hey.
Thank you. Thanks very much. So, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Let me check if you can hear me if I speak at this volume, yeah? Because I don't want to contribute. No? To, okay, I didn't want to contribute to the overall loudness, and I can get very loud, but let me know, yeah? So the first thing I wanted to do is welcome you. Welcome you to, like, oh, relax a bit, you know, on the, on the seat. I know you've all made it here probably running from another, from another event. My name is Marusha Cardama. I'm here with this Low Carbon Partnership. That stands for Sustainable Low Carbon Partnership uh, Transport. And we are uh, one of the proud members of the NDCTIA project. I shouldn't tell you anything more about that because you will get more information about it. As you can see, we are here to discuss in how we get from visions to implementation. And very much the angle of our conversation today is going to be transport decarbonization and nationally determined contributions in Asia and beyond. And with no further ado, it is my absolute honor to welcome on stage Mr. Felipe Ramirez, who is the Urban Mobility Director of the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. After Felipe, we would have another set of opening remarks. We will tell you a bit more about the project, and then we will go in a panel discussion. So stay with us, because this is promising to be a, a very juicy conversation. Thanks, Felipe. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marusha. And uh, it's my honor to be here. Uh, I'm really glad to tell you about this report that we're launching today with this amazing project that we have been working on on the NDC TIA. This is a jointly uh, work that we have been doing in WRI, GIZ, International Transfer Forum, the ITF, uh, Agora Transport Transforming. Uh, as LOCAT partnership, the RENT21, and the International Council on Clean Transportation, ICCT. So today, this report is going to talk about the achievements that we have managed to have with three different countries in order to connect this climate agenda that these two countries have with also the transforming transport to transform transportation and the policies around that transportation in order to decarbonize and to work together to have a better transportation systems within cities. So um, this project report uh, was possible by uh, the um, contributions from the German Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action and the International Climate Initiative, which is uh, we're very proud to work together. And uh, I'm very happy that Urda, the project director, is going to be able to show here the work that we have been doing. Just to mention, the importance of this is that in two years, on COP30, cities, sorry, countries will have to present the end, new indices. And we want to make sure that as many countries as possible can include transport on their targets. This is key. This is very important. And this is a big effort that has been done for years now. And we want to continue it during the next two years before COP30. So we are able to encourage many countries to include this on the targets and be able to move faster on the transportation agenda. So I'm very glad to show this report that, as you were saying, it's very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> this report that we have been working for more than a year now, and we're just going to show you. So I finish here. and. Over to you again, so uh, you can introduce the next key speaker. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Felipe. And, and bear with us, because from here, there's a lot of resonance. So sometimes, you know, we can hardly hear ourselves speaking. But, um, well, as Felipe has just uh, introduced to us, the, the NDC uh, Transport in Asia uh, project is, is actually there thanks to the funding that exists directly from the German government. And that funding comes from the International Climate Initiative, ICI, of the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Actions. And it is really our honor to have here with us today uh, Dr. Philip Behrens, who is the head of Division of International Climate Initiative in the German Federal Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs and Climate Action. And Dr. Behrens is going to tell us a bit more about the spirit of Iki, why transfer in Iki, why in the CTIA. So please come on stage. It'd be lovely to hear from you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, it's a crucial year for the international climate, right? We have the global stock take. 
going on, hopefully with a real outcome by the end of the next week. But we have read the analysis already, and the analysis show us pretty clearly, no matter which report you read, that we are far away from reaching our targets, far away from being 1.5 aligned. And, well, we should actually all take that as a wake-up call and make sure that that's not just business as usual. Next year we get the same sort of synthesis report and the year after, and they all keep telling us that we are far away from our target. No, it's actually now the time to make a real change. And as was just mentioned by Philippe, we will need to prepare the next NDCs now. And the next NDC in 2025 will come pretty soon. And uh, there we need to show that we can make a difference. And we need to show that the ambition mechanism really works. And that goes very much for the transport sector as well. Because transport is one crucial sector, is contributing 25% of re um, energy-related emissions. and. Many countries are struggling with that, and uh, believe me, I know what I'm talking about coming from Germany, because the transport sector is a crucial challenge for us as well. I'm um, in charge of the International Climate Initiative within the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action in Germany. We are impl implementing the ICI together with our colleagues from the Ministry for the Environment and Foreign Affairs. So it's three ministry implementing one program, and we have different funding uh, priorities, and mitigation is one of them. And we are doing that actually jointly with our friends from the Ministry for the Environment. And we have just launched our new strategy one week ago, and in this strategy we clearly state that transport or the transport sector will remain one of our main priorities as one of three priorities in the mitigation sector because we really see that there we need to make a difference and we need to, well, work at home of course but also support all of our partner countries to uh, be successful there. We have just today launched our new thematic call. Whoever is interested in that, you are invited to look at the ECI webpage because there is also one funding priority on transport. That is actually a, a very crucial funding priority, and we are looking for at least one very good idea for a project of a size of up to 20 million euros. In parallel, tomorrow we will have another launch of the Mitigation Action Facility. The Mitigation Action, action Facility, formerly known as the NAMA Facility, has also got not only the rebranding, but also a new setup with a clear focus on certain sectors. And one of the three sectors is transport as well. So there will be another call tomorrow. Apparently, the opportunity for funding is there. And uh, I can only encourage everyone to take that uh, seriously. So we are actually very proud to contribute to this very project because it is a flagship project for the ICI in the field of transport. And it's, it's so great to see how Germany can cooperate with uh, India, China, and Vietnam to move forward our efforts in decarbonizing the transport <coughs> sector. And I'm very proud that we can be part of that. And it, it really needs to go to all different stages. We need to have policy design, the regulatory framework needs to be there, but also on the technology side, we need to get that all improved. And that needs to go hand in hand with the energy transition, because if we have the, uh, well, EVs, that needs to be organized with a real green energy transition, and we need to have the charging in infrastructure in place. So those are all the issues we can discuss together, and we're very happy that we can do that with this project, together with our friends in the partner countries. So, uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to listening to the conversation now, and thanks a lot for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Behrens, for also confirming 
Germany's long-term commitment on transport is wonderful news, what you just brought, the two big announcements. You heard right, there's money out there to make an impact and make a difference, so I think we all need to go and check, isn't it, what these two calls are all about. And uh, also saluting the emphasis on adaptation. How many times, isn't it, we don't see the same level of attention between mitigation and adaptation conversations on transport. Thank you very much for being here with us today. The last set of uh, individual presentation that we're going to have before we go into a panel discussion is going to be uh, from Urda, Urda Heishhorst, who is the project director, precisely, of NDCTIA. Without Urda, the project wouldn't be up and running and delivering all the things that it's delivering. Urda is going to tell us a bit about the three countries, isn't it? What are we doing there? And as well, the regional and the global component of the project. So, Urda, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. and. Uh, I hope that still in my absence the project would be running, but maybe not in the same manner. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Philipp Behrens. It's a great honor to have you here, and happy birthday to the Icky, 15 years of Icky today. So I think good timing for us. I wanted to skip that. So this is the report launch. I'm very happy to uh, launch this report today, Visioning to Implementation. Uh, it's been a joint effort and an effort, as Felipe mentioned, that has been going on for a year. And I think in that sense it also represents a bit uh, this new type of ICI project where we come together, in this case with seven partners, and really working together as a team uh, to come up with uh, our project outputs. And uh, so this has been... Uh, not always easy, and I think over the years we have really grown into uh, an NDC transport initiative uh, team uh, across all our organizations. So I've mentioned this. It, the report builds on the one hand, of course, on the experiences of the NDC transport initiative in the implementation in our three partner countries, China, India, and Vietnam. But it also added to that an extensive uh, policy and uh, review of what is out there in, on the ground and uh, expert interviews in the three countries. And what we really wanted to do is to assess how uh, the link between the national climate targets, the NDCs and long-term strategies, and the implementation in the transport sector takes place in those three actually quite different countries and see what we can learn from that. And I think in the end, it's not the presentation, the final presentation that I sent that is uh, being shown here because all of these slides should not be in there. But let's just move on. So, uh, of course, all of you in this room know that uh, transport is uh, what drives a vibrant society. So we don't just talk about transport as an emissions, uh, a source of emissions, but we actually want good and efficient and quality transport systems in order to serve our societies, both uh, in the personal uh, transport sector, but also in f regarding freight transport. And at the same time, we know that the carbon budget is limited. The IPCC says 500, 400 gigatons of carbon budget left. And according to some studies, if we reach uh, 1.5, uh, want to reach 1.5 degree scenario, uh, the transport sector may emit a maximum of 110 gigatons of CO2 uh, until 2050. And if we look at the eight gigatons transport has per year now, we see that even uh, this is a really t uh, large challenge to bring down emissions from transport fast uh, in order to stay within that framework. Uh, and this would still mean that transport would eat up 28% of the remaining carbon budget. And I think it's a question whether this is fair for other sectors, if the share should be that large, but even that reaching that share is not easy. Why Asia? If emissions from transport in Asia have been growing more rapidly than anywhere else, and uh, Asia already has a huge sh share of global transport emissions, almost 40%, and uh, the growth in, uh, in Asia actually has been, here it said 3.9% per annum, but over the past 10 years, 36%, as was just recently shown in the global uh, status report that the Slocat Partnership published. And 
The only second continent is Africa with 34%, but it's coming at, at a very different level. So the emissions level in Asia is much higher and still growing at that pace. So that's why we are dealing uh, in partnership with uh, Vietnam, China, and India to implement decarbonization strategies. And what are some of the key findings? Well, first of all, all three countries during, let's say, the implementation of the project set their own net zero targets. So we have net zero targets in each of the countries, uh, Vietnam by 2050, um, China carbon neutrality by 2060, and India looking at a 2070 time frame. And when, yeah, I wanted to skip that. So if we look at uh, the targets across the three countries, we, what we can also see that they are already encompassing also non-GHG targets for many, uh, for many aspects, including EV deployment, charging and refueling. And I think I also added here for MoChIF for Vietnam, another cross that is gone in the updated <laughs> presentation that's not here. And one, also don't want to dwell on this for too long, but uh, if we look at also the transport specific measures that are included in national transport policies, we can see here that it's already very comprehensive. So all of these three countries are really doing a lot already, but of course now we, this is in terms of plans and what countries are looking forward to do, but now of course we, it's really about pushing this into implementation on the ground in order to really reach those targets. And some of the key findings uh, I would also like to present here um, is that we saw that the net zero targets on the, on the NDC level really provided impetus for more uh, in, uh, transport climate policy, at least in some of the countries. And I'm sure Mr. Zhuang will tell us a little bit more about the experience uh, in Vietnam. We still, of course, need this ambitious uh, government leadership from the top level. That's not a surprise, but uh, it continues to be very important. And um, the concept of a just an equitable transition, of which we also talk a lot at this COP, actually was a concept that didn't really come up a lot in the interviews and conversations that we were having in the partner countries. So we thought this was uh, quite interesting because while it is a really relevant aspect, uh, it was not uh, part of the mainstream conversation at this point. Then uh, new technologies, uh, questions around barriers of new technologies need to be further assessed. We see a big appetite for electric mobility, especially for co also in, for commercial vehicles, but we don't see a lot of manufacturers providing those vehicles for the demand that we actually see. Uh, in India, for instance, India aggregated the demand of, uh, for, for commercial and, and tr uh, electric vehicles and trucks, but we don't see uh, the production uh, coming up to this pace of demand yet. So that's another issue that we need to look into in the future. Financing remains critical. And I think also interesting that freight transport is receiving growing attention. Uh, we have been doing an assessment as part of the NDC Transport Initiative on the regional level uh, with the Council for Decarbonizing Transport that clearly identified uh, the freight sector still as a blind spot in the conversations that we're having. But I think we see over the past one or two years that there's really a lot more uh, focus on, uh, on freight than there used to be in the past. So this is picking up. And uh, we still see an issue of energy and transport uh, being discussed in uh, different spheres uh, at, the, at the national level, uh, even though we uh, are increasingly trying to uh, think these things together. And of course, uh, the uh, charging infrastructure and the grid questions become uh, ever more important, uh, but we don't see this very well integrated yet in the in the overall policy design. So with that, I would like to keep it uh, here because actually we want to talk about key opportunities uh, and this will be done as part of the panel discussion. So I would like to hand it over directly maybe to Christian as the moderator of the panel and uh, I'll ask all our panelists to come to the stage. Thank you very much, Oda. Um, already a shortcut. Time is flying. 
um, also for decarbonization of the transport sector. So we have to be quick, uh, and we have another well, yeah, 40 minutes uh, for a very intense and hopefully fruitful discussion. My name is Christian Hofeld. I'm the executive director of uh, Gora Transport Transformation, Berlin-based think tank on the decarbonization of the transport sector, um, mainly advising our German government, also knowing about then the challenges ahead, because it's still the problem child of the um, climate protection in Germany, because as mentioned by Mr. Behrens, we are far away from the uh, climate goals in the transport sector. But despite the fact that we are so much behind, I think a very good uh, signal is that um, now nearly 175 countries in, are discussing net zero pledges globally which means that this 90% of the GDP, the populations and the mission, which are discussing this net zero pledges. Put it also for the transport sector, and this is, uh, means that we have to come from a lot of projects on decarbonizing transport, isolated projects on decarbonizing transport, in the direction of processes. Processes to decarbonize and uh, to make sure that we will also reach the climate targets for the transport sector. And the second thing is that it shows also that, uh, you know, main barriers and main, uh, let's say, challenges on the way are, on the one hand, to transform our industries, and this can only be done together. So we need this international cooperation, not only to exchange ideas and knowledge, but also um, to give, you know, momentum to the transformation of um, our sectors. And uh, secondly, it's also about a just transition, which means access to mobility for and not limited also to private vehicles um, is um, absolutely key on the way uh, to the decarbonization. Therefore, I'm very happy to discuss this uh, with our partners in the project and uh, in the order of their targets to decarbonize the transport sector. I'm very happy now to welcome Mr. Dung to the uh, floor, and hopefully um, you will join me on the stage. He's, uh, would you? <coughs> yeah, wonderful. <laughs> um, Mr. Dung is uh, the Deputy Director General uh, at the Department for Science, Technology and Environment at the Ministry for Transport in Vietnam. And um, I would love to get from you the idea, how was uh, the, or how did you manage to integrate the transport sector in the net zero target? And um, what were the, you know, factors of success for doing it uh, as a part of the global net zero um, target for, for Vietnam. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Yeah? Um, uh, I think that uh, as all of you know, uh, in uh, at COP26, our Prime Minister uh, already announced the commitment of uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, to be net zero in 2050 uh, with the uh, efforts of the uh, country and also with the support from international uh, uh, partnership. And uh, uh, after the COP26, uh, um, Prime Minister uh, assigned a Ministry of Transport uh, to do study and uh, submit the uh, green energy transmission uh, to uh, uh, Prime Minister for uh, approval. And uh, in uh, 22 uh, of uh, July 2022, uh, we have the decision uh, 876 uh, from uh, Prime Minister uh, to approve the uh, action program on uh, uh, green energy transition uh, in the uh, transport sector uh, in order to uh, mitigate the uh, uh, carbon 
uh, the ZZ and uh, methan uh, emission from transport activity. So in this uh, decision, uh, we have uh, uh, the overall orientation uh, for uh, green energy transition for transport sector, include uh, five subsectors, uh, in, in which uh, for road uh, transport, uh, we will uh, firstly we will focus on uh, electric uh, transition, yeah? mm -hmm. and in the f further after 2030, uh, we uh, will uh, uh, focus on uh, uh, shift to uh, green energy, uh, such as uh, for hydrogen or ammonia, yeah, etc. Yeah, and. Um, uh, for transport sector, uh, after we have the decision from Prime Minister, at this moment we uh, need to do the specific uh, scenario uh, for net zero to 2050. So, so that in 2025 we, we include our target for net zero in transport sector into our update NDC. Yeah. And uh, at this moment, with the support from uh, NDC TAA project, uh, we are uh, uh, implementing the study uh, for uh, net zero um, um, roadmap in the transport sector to mm -hmm. 2050. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the first question. I will make sure that everyone um, will tell his or her story. So we start with one question and then if we have time, we will continue. Next, I'm very happy to welcome to the floor Mr. Jimin Chai from China. He's the Director for Strategy and Planning at the National Center for Climate Change Strategy and International Cooperation in China. Please uh, welcome to the floor. And he was a member or is a member of the government uh, delegation. So he's uh, very much involved also in the international discussions and negotiations on uh, climate change. So very experienced on, uh, you know, alignment on the international level of the national uh, determined contribution and national plans. And um, also my question goes to you. How did you manage to integrate the transport sector in this very ambitious um, targets on peaking transport emissions by 2030 and being nearly carbon neutral by 2060. Is this still something we can hope on? <laughs> Please. Yeah. yeah, it's a very uh, good question and for, for China. And as, as, as we know, China has announced our uh, NDCs as we will peak our uh, carbon dioxide emissions before 2030, which means not by 2030. If we can, we can make it uh, earlier. And also, uh, we uh, have a top design for mm -hmm. the whole country how to uh, implement such kind of targets into the real uh, reality. And we make uh, some kind of uh, load map uh, by sectors and industries. For example, we have a plan for, for industries like the cement, uh, 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 electricity, mm -hmm. and the steel. And also we have a, a, a load map for transportation and building as well, because it's more like a, a consumption uh, uh, or demand uh, drive uh, emissions. Uh, for, for transportations and uh, uh, within China, it's not only by the, the automobile, but also by the, the railway and the shipping and aviation, and uh, so different uh, ministries, they work together. They have a uh, overall framework to, to take here such kind of uh, load map to take it, take it to, 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 to implementation. And also we have uh, some kind of economy uh, incentive mm -hmm. policies for transportations. For, for example, we have a subsidy for the, for the new energy vehicles. Mm -hmm. And also uh, we have the standards for automobile uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and also for the, the, the fuel economy as well. Uh, uh, and also uh, with uh, some kind of uh, bottom-up innovation, for example, the cities and, uh, and, and the provinces, 
they also do lots of uh, di uh, di di diversify uh, uh, policies to encourage uh, people, for example, the, the, uh, to take uh, green transportation uh, public and share, the, uh, for example, the, the bicycle, actually, to uh, make uh, older uh, uh, people actually uh, live in the city. They will have a sense to uh, make their transportation more greener and low carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, 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 the NDC partnership actually uh, the, the, the support the, uh, by, by, the, by, the, by, by our initiative actually uh, within China has supported like a province of Guangdong mm -hmm. and Shenzhen. They do lots of uh, actually uh, practical and also innovative uh, policies to, to, to encourage uh, the, the, the good, uh, better behavior of the people, the communities as well. For example, now uh, China have a, a higher pa panel uh, stations of, uh, of uh, 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 EV, electrical vehicles, and more than over, uh, over 60% uh, of the, the, the new energy vehicles now is coming from China and used by the Chinese people. Yeah, you mentioned this, um, that you are now, I think, uh, the leader in electric uh, or electrification, at least for passenger cars. What would you think uh, ahead, um, or not only for passenger cars, also for buses, what is the next step um, in the next years, uh, what we can expect uh, from China to be the focal area of climate protection and transport. Yeah, uh, you mentioned about uh, passenger uh, vehicles, but mm -hmm. we also have a, a work plan for the, for the, for example, the heavy duty okay. vehicles. And we use the alternative fuels like uh, hydrogen, the green hydrogen, to 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 uh, replace the, the some kind of diesel or okay. some kind of that. Yeah. Wonderful. So also uh, heavy duties and uh, freight transport is um, inside and important to think about because it's even more growing than the passenger um, uh, transportation and the mobility of passengers and uh, persons. So last but not least, one of our partner countries is missing. It's uh, India. And I'm very happy to welcome to the floor to represent now the Indian partners, Mr. Pavan Bulukutla. He's the uh, program executive program director of Integrated Transport, Clean Air and Hydrogen at the uh, World Resources Institute in India, and also advising the Indian government a lot. So um, from your perspective, first of all, very happy to have you with us. Thank you. And secondly, what was the success of, uh, you know, making it that uh, India is uh, more and more supporting now? Um, on the one hand, it was a huge surprise to see um, the net zero pledge, but also now the integration of the transport sector as a, you know, success factor for having this pledge out. Yeah, I think we have completely come almost 180 degrees uh, shift in India. Um, when we started in 2018-19 and when the whole NDCTI program was being talked about, I think a big credit goes to this initiative because I think what this program has done is two things in India. One is bringing together different stakeholders because I don't think in India we believed in EVs. And I think it has really transformed that thinking with so much of consultation with manufacturers, with uh, financing institutes with government stakeholders. So there has been this whole shift in the conversation and the Forum for Decarbonizing Transport, which is part of the NDCTI initiative in India, has taken that role with all the seven partners in India in furthering the EV conversation. That's one thing that has happened. And I'll quickly talk about what is the results of those things. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is also um, bringing the stakeholders and building capacity in government. I think that has been one of the biggest contributions of this initiative through technical studies, through convenings, through really the dialogue processes. I think we really completely sometimes, a lot of times, undermine this process, which is extremely, extremely important because the whole capacity has been built into the system just because of these conversations and what these two have resulted right now. 
I think it has really helped in reframing the whole incentive structure in India in FAME 2, which is the Government of India's incentive program, because the FAME 1 never took off. We didn't, after three, four years also, there was no uptake of EV vehicles. Mm -hmm. Because of this um, contribution to this forum and many more other partners who came together, the business models were tweaked. The way the incentive structure was designed was redone. And that has resulted in more than 5,700 electric buses right now operating in India with 20,000 buses under procurement. This is happening now. And the government of India has talked about the viability gap funding and the payment security mechanisms for ensuring that the contracts are viable. I think we are working high level pledges excellent but how do you really achieve that and i think this project is really demonstrating that so the buses story is that the next is we have 1.2 million two wheelers electric two wheelers that are operating in india we have close to more than 1 million three wheelers that are operating in india we have close to almost 100000 cars that are operating electric cars that are operating in india and finally we are talking about freight decarbonization right now all this has been possible just in a span of three to four years. And I think it's a big, it's n we don't talk really that much about the success of these programs because if I had shown the pictures, it is mind blowing. You look at the depots that we are talking about with all electric buses. We had look at like, you know, for waste management, there are like thousand vehicles that were just launched in one city. Of course, nothing is enough in India for the sheer scale of our country. But I think we really need to understand why these models are becoming successful and how do we ensure that there is more of global south-south understanding because this is the knowledge that really need, we need to learn from other geographies, what Colombia is doing, what Chile is doing and you know really take this. I think one of the biggest contribution of this platform has been the ability to facilitate, although it was just India, China, Vietnam, but I think we have taken this initiative to different parts of the world. And uh, you know, I was in Costa Rica two months back and I was exactly talking about the NDCTI's contribution and all over that how we actually can come together to really make difference. Because to me, these kind of ensuring bankable contracts, ensuring that you know, business models that will work and how does this really feed into the NDCs for the transport sector? Because people want to see what works in Global South. What are those models that will really work? Because I think we get enough of understanding, but there is no recipe to how to make it happen. And if we can do that part, I think, then that's the success story that we should be talking about. And this is what it is all about. So, no, but th uh, Urda, I really want to thank you and the team because I don't think if this forum ex didn't exist, I don't think it would have been possible for this journey in India for sure. Thank you. <laughs> Warm applause for Urda. And one question in addition, um, which is, um, I mean, India has a huge vehicle industry and a huge workforce. Um, it's incredibly huge, you will tell it. Uh, it's not me, I, uh, maybe I mix up the numbers, but uh, I know that in Germany we started uh, very much with skepticism and uh, that the worker unions in the automotive industry were very afraid of this transformation to a new propulsion system, to electrification. But now they are one of the parties which are, you know, pushing government, which are pushing business in the direction of electrification because it will be a guarantee to save jobs. How is the situation in India with the workforces and the labor unions uh, supportive or non-supportive to this um, uh, transformation. I think for them all it matters is do they have a job, will they have a job, right? Sure. And I think um, one of the fourth largest automobile industry uh, in India with direct and indirect jobs, almost 30 million people are employed in the automobile industry, right? That's the scale of the automobile industry. As of now, we are seeing that a lot of the existing uh, ICE OEMs are actually transitioning into the EV OEMs. And I think that's a good part of it because that way um, it really ensures that you actually have these two parallel tracks going on and we are discovering what are the jobs that will be lost, the jobs that will be uh, will continue to exist and what are the jobs that will be created new. So in that in, uh, thing, what has been happening is one thing is 
partnership between manufacturers and the subnational governments, mm -hmm. where they are actually dip doing this whole skilling program to really ensure that this transition is smooth. I feel we are not aggressive enough because this transition is not going to happen in the next two, three years, right? Because the way it is structured. So I think the automobile industry is going to take at least 10, 15 years to really get into that transition. We are only targeting 30% electrification by 2030, and that is a big number. But challenges exist. Um, I think we are still learning. There are some modeling exercises which show the green jobs potential in this sector. A lot of it is in the downstream and in tier two and tier three supply. So I think we are also learning, honestly. We don't have any bullet um, answer saying that, okay, this is what is working. But we don't, the concerns are well understood by the government. And therefore, if you see, there's been a little bit of this uh, challenge whether how aggressive OEMs want to be. And that's why you see none of the Indian OEMs have announced they're phasing out of the diesel cars, right? Because they are like, jobs is actually going to be a very, very critical part when we are talking about environment. And that's why um, there's been very cautious in terms of how the uh, government and manufacturers are really thinking about this transition. Thank you very much, Pavan. And now I'm very happy to welcome on the floor one of our distinguished uh, project partners. Laura Williamson from REN21 in Paris, but uh, also working globally on the nexus between energy and transport. So I, as we learned, I think the most critical nexus, uh, <laughs> nexus, um, we have, uh, yeah, <laughs> some nature also in this pavilion. We should be happy about this. And um, yeah, as I'm saying, the most important nexus between the sectors uh, to be addressed, uh, the uptake of the renewables has to be hand in hand with the electrification of transport. So how do you see the progress there and what makes you confident that um, these uh, sectors will be aligned um, by the NDCs uh, in the future? Well, thank you. And, and just to start off, so I'm going to come at this from the renewable energy perspective. Um, I was sitting here thinking, I remember the first time ever at a COP that we had renewable energy come to a transport event was in Marrakesh. Mm -hmm. So that was 22, <laughs> yeah. right? So that was COP 22. We're now at COP 22. That was six years ago. And look how far we've come. So I think that in and of itself is incredibly uh, reassuring. But Erda's last point, point number seven on your, your things, is that we still have um, big blind spots. And I'll speak, I'll speak from the renewable energy uh, perspective. Um, we, from the renewable energy perspective, are not very good at listening to our clients. Uh, and that's what we need to do for the transport sector. What is it that the transport sector needs to decarbonize? Um, and what is it and how can, we, how can we support that in a way that also ensures sustainable, low carbon transport? Uh, we were working with Slowcat on this uh, fossil free um, land transport pledge and we had pushback from our members and we were genuinely surprised. We're like decarbonization of land transport. What is there not to like from the renewable energy perspective? But for many of our colleagues in the renewable energy sector, for them, what was important was that we weren't the, the I don't say the bone of contention, but the sticking points was there wasn't enough emphasis on decarbonization of power, mm -hmm. so electrification, but also on, um, on the fact that uh, biofuels were not included. Uh, but why was walking and biking included? How is that decarbonized? Huge blind spot, right? Of course it's decarbonized. It's not using any fossil fuels. But we don't see it that way. And so I think one of the things that we really need to do now, now that there's a real acknowledgement about the role that renewables can play in decarbonizing transport, is also to educate the renewable energy sector about what de does decarbonization mean? Because we always come at it from a fuel perspective. The flip side is, is I think with the transport sector, we need to say yes, it's electrification, decarbonized electrification, but we also have biofuels. I know that there are many conversations around this and there are sustainability issues, but we are not 
going to decarbonize the transport sector unless we really look at the whole panoply of decarbonized options, whether they're fuels, whether it's, whether it's power, um, particularly because you have urban transport, which has a certain level of demand, you have long distance rail, you have shipping, uh, and so we really need to, yes, um, renewable electricity is key, but it's only one part of the solution. Wonderful. Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss this because it's one of the most controversial issues, I would say, at this time, that we need all solutions. I think everyone agrees on this. But do we need all solutions for all transport modes? That, I think, is... Uh, I have an opinion. I will hide this. <laughs> but I will come to an end with one question to you. Now we started this NDC uh, TAA initiative, this, um, and if you now come to a country or meet one of the delegates from an uh, African country here in Dubai, and they are asking you, well, how should we start to work uh, and to decarbonize the transport sector based on our net zero pledge? What would you say is your number one recommendation they should do? And I start with uh, Mr. Pavan, uh, or with you, Pavan. No time for <laughs> thinking about it. Uh, the other has a little bit more time. But what is number one recommendation they should do for including transport in the NDC and in the net zero pledge? You look at two wheelers and three wheelers with mini grids. I think that will be an opportunity for job creation and also decarbonizing the transport sector. And I think that would be a win win situation when you're tackling both the powers that require for access to energy access and at the same time mobility and jobs. That's why WI is doing such a good job because they talk to their colleagues in Africa already. <laughs> <laughs> so now, <laughs> Mr. Jimin from China, what would you recommend? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, China and uh, together with other uh, developing uh, uh, countries, uh, we are doing some kind of source source cooperation with uh, uh, smart actually support uh, from fi finance, also mm -hmm. technology transfer, and also capacity buildings. And I think uh, we will not uh, left one behind. And uh, together, hand in hand, we uh, uh, shift to a, a more sustainable and low carbon uh, future in the transportation sectors. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I think this is important that this South-South cooperation uh, plays such a big role. Uh, we also see that the example of Chile, not represented here, but makes a lot of uh, noise in the international arena because they are also doing this very successful. Mr. Duong, what would be your recommendation to your African colleagues uh, with regard to the success and maybe recommendations for the transport sector and action in this field? Uh, I think that the, for transport sector, we have the challenge in uh, decarbonize. Yeah. Uh, for passing the car, it's easy for us. But if we think of uh, more time and air vision, it's very difficult to decarbonize. Yeah. So I think that the uh, for us, we uh, step by step to uh, uh, implement the uh, energy efficiency for the uh, transport uh, system. Uh, and uh, together with uh, the uh, energy sector, uh, we will see the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the ship to the green uh, energy and uh, electricity. Uh, in, in the future in order to uh, achieve the net zero target. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much for mentioning energy efficiency here as also a backbone of a successful transformation. And Laura, what would be your recommendation so that in six years we're talking about what? <laughs> yes. COP34 then? Yes. You're now testing our math skills. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, would, I would say yes, transport as an entry point, but not to stop there. I think what we can really use with uh, the renewable tr or the decarbonization of, of the transport sector is very much about bringing in urban planning, um, industrial development, um, 
skills and, and, and training. So transport as the entry point, but not the end point, if that, if that makes sense. Using the transport, using the mobility of people, goods and services, economic development, to really inform what's happening on industrialization, um, on, on design and planning, because all those factors feed back into how we move around as people and as communities. Couldn't find better words, which means that this transport transformation is not a transport project, but a part of a societal transformation, um, which is a prerequisite for our sustainable economic and societal development of the future. So in this sense, I think, first of all, thank you very much for the panel discussion, but not limited to this, but for the continuous cooperation over the last years. It was really a great cooperation and a great learning also for us, also for Germany, um, how to decarbonize our transport sector. I think uh, it's not only that <laughs> we are here to you know, share our experiences, it's also that we take along and take away uh, a lot of other things for our strategies and the, which uh, <laughs> needs to be improved in the future. So thank you very much to all of you. And so I hand over nearly in time to Marusha. And uh, again, time is flying. Thanks very much. A round of applause for Christian. Could I have this one? Well, thank you very much. This was spotlessly on time. And that means that we are getting to the very last uh, uh, thoughts that we would like to share with you. And what we want to do is a bit is look forward, you know, look ahead and see what's coming up. And to do that, I'm going to invite here on stage with me Dr. Jari Kapula, who is the head of the Secretary General's Office and the head of the Quantitative Policy Analysis and Foresight in the International Transport Forum. Jari, what about you and I took a sit to continue with a cozy, you know, space that I think Christian created for us? And that way we can send these people in style as well afterwards. So, Jari, looking ahead, what a wonderful journey that we had with this uh, project, isn't it? Absolutely. And thank you, first of all, inviting me here as well. And uh, I have to say, you completely destroyed my speaking notes oh. now by inviting me. But that's even better because <laughs> <laughs> we don't need them. We need them at all, right? <laughs> I think that's the point. Um, no, uh, first of all, it's been fantastic to be part of this team of, of the NDCTIA. And it's, it's, it's as I said in the beginning, it's, it's been a learning experience, I think, for, for, for all of us. Is we've been learning through this journey. And, and not only, uh, I think, I hope it's been helpful for India, China, Vietnam, but also for us or as an organization, as an ITF as well. And, and uh, this has been really, really uh, excellent. I really didn't mean to destroy anything, so go ahead with what you had in mind. I'm pretty sure it was very juicy. No, I, I, I don't think, I, I think the key thing that I wanted to say, first of all, is, is exactly what was said. We're running out of time, as in this session, but also in terms of reaching the 1.5. Uh, there's a huge gap Absolutely. between the ambition. What, what really needs to happen is, is, is to have a call for strong action and implementation of the NTCs, not only ambition in the NDCs, but really, really action and implementation of them. I think this is sort of the key points that, that are coming out. And I think governments do have, and of course I'm representing an organization that represents governments, governments have a key role in that. And, and if I may say one, one please, thing please. from my speaking notes that Absolutely. I would like we to say, I, I think the, 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 uh, the point is that we need to change the way we plan, the planning in the governments. Planning should move away from us thinking uh, we need to manage the, uh, uh, provide the infrastructure as a reaction sort of to the demand that is happening there and move to a vision-led planning, planning what kind of outcomes we want to have and, and, and make that planning starting from there. Absolutely, and I think that perhaps building upon the point uh, Laura brought when we're talking about transport and energy here, we, we sort of have the three magical nexus that we could potentially get together in terms of integrated planning. That would be the transport, the energy, and the land planning, isn't it? But keep on going if you want, because thanks to, thanks to Christian's wonderful moderation on the panel, we have a few minutes, so if you want to tell us something else, go ahead. I, Otherwise, you know, we could conclude. But no, no, I, I, no, no, nobody wants to conclude. We just want to continue because we are <laughs> running out of time. Until just, wanted midnight. To, just wanted to make the point about actually what we mentioned about the energy transport nexus. And, and I don't know if you knew, there was just before this event, it was the first, Marosi, you were there, energy transport ministers meeting at COP. And this was the first time it was done with the IEA, ITF, jointly organized under the UAE presidency. And we really hope to see that this is just a starting point. But again, it, we can't just say, okay, let's start. We have to really, really move fast now. 
uh, to, to combine this, these two nexus. And, and, Absolutely, and, and I think that the conversation that we had in that room a couple of hours ago was very much along those lines about ministers from both sectors clearly uh, with an appetite, I think, of getting closer together and having this kind of conversation. So really kudos to ITF and IEA for putting this together, building upon the, the first time ever, which was back in Glasgow, isn't it, that we brought a we thanks a to you, uh, transport ministers. With, with you guys, so. so, you know, looking at six cops ahead, I don't know, we might be building all sorts of other nexuses because I think that what today's ministerial is, is showing us as well is the importance of connecting transport with other sectors to the point of society approaches and, and economy approaches that you were making uh, here, Christian. So any other thoughts as we look ahead or shall I close in style you, your you last last call last call for last a few more call. thoughts okay. if I look at my notes I think that one one option <laughs> you said I have last call um, <laughs> it should be about electrification only electric congestion is congestion so we need to really talk about moral shift and 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 alternative sustainable modes of transport uh, I think there's an opportunity here is that as we electrify the tax revenues for governments will fall from fuel taxes and that's an opportunity to move for congestion charging, uh, uh, distance based charging to, to actually uh, change, change the game as well. Absolutely. Thanks very much for that. So what is left for me is really to, to, to try to send you home or somewhere else in this huge venue safely, thanking you extremely you know, for being here with us today because the competition is fierce. There's many other things that you could have listened to. But before sending you in style, let's go briefly together through those recommendations that we have in this report, you know, that, that actually is tracked thanks to the efforts led by WRI and, and, and the whole consortium as well, the recommendations for, yeah, why not the next round of NDCs and what is it that we could be doing together. So the idea of aligning long-term ambition with short-term actions for the transfer sector, ensuring that we're not managing the sector only in silos, but that we are connecting it to the other sectors, as we were saying here, leveraging multi-stakeholder partnerships to actually enable the kind of actions and change that are required, focusing on the equitable and the just transition, following a systematic approach to transport decarbonization, crafting integrated and comprehensive policy mix for electric mobility with the panoply of, uh, of instruments and solutions that exist. And last but not least, support sustainable financing availability and move away from fossil fuels. In that tone, Laura, you already did it to me uh, on, on my behalf and on behalf of all of us. I wanted to leave you uh, with an invitation to check out a hashtag that is fossil free transport. Under that hashtag, you can see the call to action that Laura was referring to that was initiated by Slocan and Run21 jointly with uh, IDRI, ITDP, UIC, UITP, and WRI. We are now at 50 multi stakeholder signatories, and basically, this is about doubling the share of energy efficient and fossil free forms of land transport for goods and for people by 2030. It is visible and actually by working together the transport and energy sectors, we are multiplying the strategic opportunities that I think Laura so well represented in the previous panel. And we are multiplying as well the social, the economic and the environmental benefits that come out of that. The message is clear. I think that this kind of COPs and, and precisely the meeting we were just coming from are um, our audience. We want to send that critical message, that very clear and ambitious message that is possible and that the time to start thinking about that is next year. There are universal enablers. All those universal enablers are going to have to be landed naturally through the nationally determined approaches that every country will see. But the time is next year. So hopefully by the first quarter of 2025, we will have a wonderful set of SDGs that, of NDCs that could be really strong on transport and connect transport as well with other sectors. So thanks for the opportunity for being here with our fellow partners. Thanks very much to the ICI program, to the German government, and thanks Ulda, really, for bringing us all the way here as partners in this project. Appreciate it.